Hello, Wisconsin. Welcome to the 11 o'clock hour of As Goes Wisconsin. Got a full, fully packed hour. But uh, if you missed anything in the first hour, go back and listen to it as a podcast, which you can find at asgoeswisconsin.com slash listen or on Spotify, on Apple, wherever you find your podcasts. But now we are happy to welcome back after she was not here last week because she had to be a doctor and it was in surgery. Mm. But Dr. Kristen Lyerly is here for our weekly segment, Public Service Announcement, where we uh, mostly talk about women's health issues. But we're also here, well, she's here, to uh, answer any of your health questions as an answer as best as she can. So how are you, friend? I am great. And please do call with questions because we love to be interactive and make sure that you have the information that you need to be able to make your decisions in the context of your own life. So yeah, we love callers. Absolutely. Um, all right. So just, just start off with some quick headlines. Uh, the first one with Narcan. Yeah. It's like super quick headlines. Narcan is going to be over the counter as early as next week. It's going to be expensive, but yeah. it'll be available shipping out now. So that's exciting. But my favorite quick headline is that female surgeons have better outcomes than male surgeons. Sorry, guys. How does How did they measure this? They looked at a number of key markers, including morbidity and death, and they determined that female surgeons have better outcomes. So and is, <laughs> and is that because I think I've seen before that they've done the differences of female and male doctors when treating female patients. Mm -hmm. But for this study, is this a no matter the gender of or the sex of the patient that they're just in general, female surgeons, better outcome? Yes. And this is consistent with what we see in the medical world as well. We know that people who are treated by female medical physicians tend to have better outcomes. Now, we're not talking monumentally better outcomes. Yeah. Like, you know, men are good doctors and surgeons. Like, I am not male bashing here <laughs> at all. But I, I just have to gloat a little bit. When I saw this headline, I was like, we at least have to say this. Well, and do they point to why that might be? They speculate. That okay. It could have something to do with women taking a little bit more time, being a little bit more precise. I mean, it's all speculation. Who really knows? Yeah. Because I, I, the bed, how much bedside manner were you taught in med school? You can't learn bedside manner. But this, you know what I mean? Like that, like, I think that's something that we're now realizing that like is not taught. Like it's not like a class of like how, to, how to be a compassionate doctor, right? Well, they do try to okay. teach it, but some people just have it. And other people just don't. And, you know, that's one of the really challenging things when you are looking for a doctor and you Google somebody and you see all of those rating websites. Yeah. So you see docs with like four and five star ratings because they're nice or because, you know, you went to the office and you had a good experience with the office staff. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're great surgeons or great doctors. If you want to know if they are technically great at what they do, ask a nurse. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But you don't always have access to a nurse either. No. But that's, that's a good around. point. As as we just got through uh, Mike's back surgery, who I think both of his, his vascular surgeon and the orthopedic surgeon um, did come highly recommended by people who had had surgeries from them. Mm -hmm. But sometimes when you're first picking a doctor, that gets really daunting as far as like, how do you pick someone besides yeah. like, are they or are they not in my network? But beyond that... And you look at like a list of names, you're like, I don't know any of these people from Adam. And so how do I, besides those reviews, how do you pick someone and get in and do you just kind of just like close your eyes and throw a dart? Yeah. I mean, so often it's because what you just said, it's because you're referred by a friend who had an experience with somebody, but you don't really know. And this gets really tricky with OB because sometimes you pick a midwife and you think, well, a midwife is a midwife, but a midwife is not a midwife. Some midwi midwives have- Or a midwife is not an OB. It is not an OB, but even midwives, all midwives are not the same. Some oh, okay. midwives receive certified nurse midwives, receive a certain degree of training, and they are plugged in with a professional organization, and there are really tedious standards that they have to obey. And then other midwives are lay midwives. Like they may not really have any training other than experience or some online school that they took, and their credentials aren't necessarily helpful to you as you're trying to figure out who is the best person to care for me and my baby. 
Yeah. All right. Well, moving on to the next headline, uh, you had put this in for last week, but we couldn't get to it. But basically, you're saying I should be walking. Shouldn't we all? <laughs> Shouldn't we all be walking? But, <laughs> but there was a study that said walkable neighborhoods encourage pregnant women to get more exercise, which leads to good outcomes for both mom and baby. So how much should I be walking in this last month of pregnancy? Pregnancy is a little bit different. And you can generalize this information to all of us. If we live in neighborhoods where we can get out and walk and ride, we're going to do that more often. If you can just walk a block to the grocery store, you're not going to jump in your car and drive a block to the grocery store. So people who live in these walkable neighborhoods, we know the data shows that they do tend to get enough exercise, at least more exercise than people who don't live in walkable and bikeable neighborhoods. For pregnant women, it's a little bit different because, you know, you're different when you're pregnant. And Mm -hmm. You have to take into account how healthy you are. Are you having any complications with the pregnancy? How are your feet and your legs? And, you know, like, how does that all come together for you? So it is a little bit different when you're pregnant. But you can take all of this information and you can put it in the context of public health, where what we really need to be doing, and the University of Wisconsin has done a great deal of research in this area, is creating walkable neighborhoods Mm -hmm. where we have grocery stores and restaurants and the things that you need just to live your day-to-day life within a close distance to Mm -hmm. your house. We see, especially in, you know, bigger cities like Milwaukee, there are certain neighborhoods where they have food deserts. It's almost impossible for them to get access to fresh produce. They can't walk to where they need to go. And we see worse health outcomes there. So the way that we design cities and policies like complete streets, which used to be a statewide policy, and now it's more within the different municipalities, thankfully, if we can implement some of these policies, we will in general, be healthier. What just quickly, because then we got a, we have a question from a caller. Um, what is Complete Streets for people who don't know? Oh, Complete Streets is a policy that is supported by the CDC and the Institute of Medicine and lots of other major organizations that that seeks to encourage bike traffic and walking traffic by making safe spaces. So Mm -hmm. you may have noticed bike lanes or bike paths that are next to busy streets. That is intentional to give people a safe place to be able to walk or ride or get out with strollers or, you know, just, just congregate. And it's not just your physical body, but it's also your heart, your emotional well-being. If you're out walking to a restaurant and you bump into your neighbor, you're going to have a conversation and that's going to create that sense of community. So the the more we can do that, even in Wisconsin, even in the winter, people still do get out, the healthier we all will be. Awesome. All right. Who we got on the phone, Greg? We got uh, Tom calling from Grafton, has a question about the new COVID medication. Tom, what say you? Um, morning, ladies. I, I'm wondering, should I wait a few months? Um, I, I'd heard that, this, it, that the shot will be coming out in <clears throat> September or, or October. So I'm wondering if I should wait a few months or if I should get it right away. And I'm wondering if people get ill, but I, I have a comment too. Um, you mentioned that, that, that women doctors have slightly better outcomes. Um, I have a, I, I'm an aviation um, buff. And in world war II, the, the United States found that um, they would ferry um, all kinds of airplanes, bombers, fighters from the U S over to Europe. And they found that the women pilots had a lower crash rate. And to me, it just shows, you know, unless you're talking strictly strength, that women can do almost anything, you know, that men can do, um, you know, if they put their mind to it. And, you know, that's not to say that people don't have the strengths and weaknesses, but um, I, I, thought, I thought that was really interesting. That is super interesting, Tom. I love that you said that, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so the question, so the, but the question, so the question, if I'm asking, if I'm hearing you right, is should you get, how, how soon should you get the next COVID shot? Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Yes. So the new COVID shot is coming out mid-September. This is the one that should cover the current variant that I don't know if you've been hearing in the news, but COVID is making a comeback again. We're Mm going to see these surges and falls. So we're in the midst of a surge now. It's Omicron, so it's not nearly as scary as it was at the beginning of the pandemic, but it's still, you know, a significant risk for people who are immunocompromised, who are older. So definitely do get your COVID vaccine 
but don't get it until mid-September or even October for two reasons. One, it's the most recent, it will be the most recent variant. And two, it doesn't last forever. Just like a flu shot, it peaks after a couple of months and then it starts to wane. Its effectiveness starts to wane. So if you get it too early, you may peak before flu season and COVID season are in full burst. We know that once we start going back inside, we can anticipate that there will be a surge, especially in northern areas. So waiting until late September or October, I think is your best bet. There you go. Thanks for the call, Tom. Um, That is actually a good segue for what we're going to talk about when we come back, because I want to get your thoughts. There was a um, New York Times article this morning that kind of is talking about, as we, like you said, there is a rise in COVID again. And I think there's just like this mentality that I've had it once. I survived. It's fine. And so I think looking into like how fine is it to get COVID multiple times? How much are you susceptible for like long term, long COVID type symptoms if you get it multiple times? So I wanted to get your opinion on that um, when we come back. But also from a medical, from your medical point of view, want to get your opinion. And this is taking politics out of it. What is going on with Mitch McConnell? Oh, So yeah. think about that. Because I just want, like, when you see someone, like, glitch out like that, what could be going on? So mm-hmm. no, no stigma attached. I just want to know. From a doctor's point of view, what is happening? So we will be back with Dr. Kristen Lyerly after the break. Text us any more questions that you have, 844-967-2789. This is As Goes Wisconsin. Try along with Dr. Kristen Lyerly, and this is Public Service Announcement, our weekly Thursday segment where we answer your questions, talk about women's health. We've talked a lot about my pregnancy, <laughs> we <have. laughs> um, which uh, we are a month out from. But uh, one of the things I wanted to get your opinion on was because as COVID is rising, and actually I was at a Journal Sentinel event last night. Last week, I ended up not going into the office at all um, because there was people, people that a lot of people had COVID. And so they're like, everyone will stay home this week. And so I've had it twice, both times. It was just like, I got, it was just felt like I was really sick, but I got over it. So what, like how bad is a second or third or fourth case of COVID and how much should you take for granted? Like if you've had it once, well, it's just like a cold. And so if I get it again, no big deal. Like, is that a good attitude to have? Or what do you think? We don't know. Okay. So uh, the data is not helpful here because everybody is different. What kind of COVID did you have? When did you get it? What is your immune system like? All of these questions are going to help determine whether you're going to get really sick if you get it again, or if you're not even going to know that you have it and you're just a carrier. So ultimately, I would say don't put yourself in harm's way. Continue as you know that the cases are starting to rise again. Don't take chances. And I don't mean you have to go out in public with a mask on. But, you know, when you're in public, be outside if you have that choice. Um, if you feel sick, take a COVID test because there is a really great medication to treat COVID. So if you have it, you want to know that you have it so that you Mm -hmm. can treat it. And remember that there are people who still can get very sick from COVID, immunocompromised and older people. So please just, you know, have some grace and show them respect. If you see them in public with a mask on, they likely have complicating factors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also like, it's not fun being sick, period. Mm-mm. Like whether it's a cold, whether it's a flu, whether it's COVID, like just being reckless just because you're like, well, I've had it. It's like, well, like, do you really want to be sick? Do you really want to like be out for the count for four days or more when uh, you could be working or living your life? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And having so. to not be able to be with your friends and doing the things that you want to be doing. So, you know, just just be, be smart, be nice, take care of each other. It's a good motto. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we have two texts, but before we get to the text, just because I'm so curious, uh, usually we would talk about this in like a political sense of like, oh, term limits, age limits. But just from a medical standpoint, um, we saw the video yesterday of Mitch McConnell once again at a Kentucky Chamber of Commerce 
meeting, be asked a question and just went blank again for the second time in a month, basically. Mm -hmm. So what could this could be happening where like that when you are in front of a group and you just go blank like that, what could be happening in your brain or in your health that leads you to think of maybe what he's dealing with? Remember back in March when he had a fall and he got a concussion and he broke a rib, I think. So he really hasn't been himself since that happened. And if you go way back when he was young, he had polio. Remember back in the day, polio was a really big deal. It's a vaccine that we were able to eradicate in this country way back in 1979 because of vaccines. Mm -hmm. So that still, though, many people experience post polio symptoms. And as you get older, they're more likely to manifest themselves like so many other things. So we don't know what's happening. Yeah, of of course, this is all speculation. But I was just because everyone's going to talk about it politically. Mm -hmm. And I was just interested as far as like, seeing that what you as a doc, your doctor brain goes, what could this be? It doesn't seem like it's a stroke. It could okay. be little TIAs. It could be a neurological problem like a Parkinson's disease that's not okay. appropriately managed. It could be a million different things. Yeah. And I think the thing for most of our listeners to consider is if this is happening to you, please seek medical help. We hope that Senator McConnell is seeking medical help, and I'm sure he is. You know, this is really scary, and I'm so glad that you took politics out of it because it it has nothing to do with that. He's a human being in the world who is an important leader in this country, and we just, we wish him the best. Absolutely. Um, Greg, do we have time for a couple text questions? Yeah, we can do a couple. Uh, Let's start with just, uh, we were talking about COVID COVID before. Is uh, From the uh, 310, is there any correlation between COVID and hair loss. My hairdresser as has feels, oh, sorry, this is kind of breaking up here. My hairdresser feels she is seeing that. A family member had COVID about two months ago and is losing her hair now. Could there, could there be connection? There could be, but hair loss can be due to so many different things. It could be thyroid dysfunction. It can be related to menopause. It can be related to lots of um, just personal, you know, issues that you can have. So, but it could be COVID. I would say go talk to a dermatologist or maybe even start with your general practitioner and just get some basic labs run. And then next step would be derm if you don't get an answer right off the bat. Okay. And then uh, next one, I am 50 going through menopause for the last five years or so. I have breast pains and can be as bad as when I breastfed. Anything Mm -hmm. I can do? Yeah. Menopause is tough. You know, the menopause transition is really about 10 years. So if you're 50, you are likely smack dab in the middle of it. Um, With regards to breast pain, it's probably related to varying levels of progesterone that you're producing right now. Um, What can you do? Again, talk to your doctor. It may be time for a hormone supplements like a progesterone supplement and estrogen supplement to help ease you through the transition. There are lots of different things that you can do. One other thing, wear a supportive garment, a supportive bra that may help as well. Interesting. Mm -hmm. We had one more question, but we don't have time because we have less than a minute left. So uh, from the 608 questions also with perimetopause and hormone imbalances. So I will save that and we'll we'll do it next week. Uh, Dr. Kristen Lyerly, this always goes so fast. But it's so much fun to have you here. Can't wait to see you again next week. And uh, have fun at the Minnesota Gophers game. Yeah, Sky you mom, I go for friends. <laughs> uh, uh, <blah. laughs> go All Panthers. Right. I don't know. <laughs> Nebraska. Spe- yeah. Speaking speaking of sports, when we come back, Paul Noonan will be here to talk about why he is recklessly optimistic about the Packers. Stick around. This is As Goes Wisconsin. Speaking of sports, will we get it in? If they want to go to all the bases, I hope they do. If they're supposed to run past the line or whatever, I hope they do that too. Sports go sports. They have their opponents numerically in the allotted time. Let's disenfranchise their audience and see their revenues decline. May the partakers be sturdy and rapid in the spirited energies they exert. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. Greg Bach is on the board, and we are welcoming back Paul Noonan, who covers the Packers for Shepherd Express and Acme Packing Company. He also hosts weekly podcasts reporting as eligible on the Packers and Milwaukee's Tailkid Posket podcast on the Brewers. Happy to have you back, sir. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. 
Um, so let's start. Let's start with the Brewers. The winning streak is over, but boy, that was that a winning streak. It was a great winning streak. It's too bad that we didn't get free cheeseburgers, but you know, that only happens like once a decade. So it is what it is. <laughs> Ran into some bad luck against the Cubs with the wind blowing in at Wrigley, which is not good for the Brewers who have trouble scoring runs anyway. And uh, but, you know, it's a great win streak. They, they built a nice lead. They can afford to have a couple stumbles and they're really in good shape going forward uh, in terms of making the postseason. So, yeah. So what what is the kind of the landscape now for this final month? Because really, it's just September. And then it like what was what's the regular season look like? Um, they have a couple weeks. Uh, a couple weeks it ends on october 1st so it really is just it. Okay. september that's that's it um and they do have a couple of long road trips left uh but they're not terribly intimidating ones they looked bad at the start of the season but um they go to pittsburgh um after they play the phillies at home next which the phillies are a good team and the brewers aren't going to have their their big guns pitching against them because burns and woodruff just faced the cubs and lost you know nail biters so that's a bit of a tough one if they take it on the chin a little bit to start this i don't i wouldn't be that surprised but they get the the pirates and the yankees both of who have struggled horribly this season it's really odd to see the yankees struggle ever uh but that that's like a, a kind of an easy series for like the first time ever wow. um yeah and uh then they fit when the, the league makes the schedule, they always figure that the Brewers, Cubs, and Cardinals are going to be good. So they kind of stack them up at the end. And so the Brewers still have a whole bunch of games against the Cardinals. They go to St. Louis for four, and then they have three games like immediately after that. But the Cardinals are terrible now for the first time ever. So it's never fun to see them because they are annoying and they are spoilers. <laughs> um, yep. But those are games where the Brewers should take care of business. Most importantly, right. they finish against the Cubs, three games at Miller Park. And the Cubs and Brewers are now tied 5-5 on the season series. So that is both a game to uh, both a series to get the tiebreaker and also to potentially just win the division. Um, but it's a, it's not a hard schedule. The Brewers should be able to take care of this if they just play how like they played the last month. And what changed? Like what kind of what what was the the magic sauce or the stadium sauce, I should say, uh, that got that kind of led off this winning streak? Um, a couple things all kind of came together. So their trade deadline was not super exciting, um, but it made their lineup quite a bit more difficult to get through. So they added Carlos Santana and Marcana. Um, those guys are kind of average major league players, but the Brewers had a very top heavy lineup with like basically two good hitters and Christian Yelich and William Contreras. And after that, pitchers could kind of just mow them down, even if they got into some trouble. Um, now that's not the case anymore, especially with South Frela coming up and being a, a worthwhile bat as well. And now they go five or six deep in their lineup. It's much harder to navigate for opposing pitchers and, uh, and adding an extra run or two a game to this Brewers pitching staff is really useful because they're the best in the league at shutting people down if they get a lead. Uh, they got Brendan Woodruff back at the same time. Their pitching staff improved that way. And the other kind of secret one is Freddie Peralta has been absolutely dynamite in the second half. He is, uh, despite pitching one fewer game than uh, any other starting pitcher in the, on this list, he is fifth in the league in strikeouts. Uh, he, he had 177 going into his last start, and uh, he, it's been unhittable Freddie. When you get him, at plus Woodruff and Burns at the top, it's hard to beat that. All right. All right. Greg, I, how are you feeling? I'm, As... I'm feeling really good, and and that doesn't feel good. <laughs> as a Brewers fan, as a Brewers fan, I'm used to like it just being a spiral or getting way too excited for a wild card. Or uh, the question I have is, I mean, and, and everyone has this question is, what do we need to start doing now to prepare ourselves for an inevitable face off against Atlanta or Los Angeles? <laughs> I mean, they are they are amazing. They're both. They yeah. yeah. And, and it, you're, you're right. Those two teams are quite a bit better than everybody else in the national league by any metric that you want to run through run differential, just pure talent. Um, yeah. What you want to do if you're the Brewers is not mess around with the Cubs in that last series. You want to have a lead and set up your rotation because the key to the Brewers winning in the playoffs is having Burns, Woodruff and Peralta ready to go and not having to waste them at winning the division or making the playoffs. Yeah. If they can do that, they can hang with the Braves and the Dodgers because those guys can shut down any lineup, and then you just need to squeak out a few runs against them. But if you get into the back end and you, you're forced to pitch Miley or somebody else, um, you're going to get yourself down and get yourself in trouble. So it's important that they finish strong so that they can set themselves up in the best way possible. 
And stay healthy. Stay, you don't stay punch healthy. any walls. Yeah. Don't punch any walls. <laughs> oh, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, speaking of being optimistic, I saw you tweet out, uh, you want, is it, I don't know if it's your most recent article, but something you wrote this week about the Packers. And you are recklessly optimistic. I don't think of you as a wreck. I don't know you super well, but we've been doing this for like a year. You don't come off as someone who is recklessly optimistic. You, no, you, you come off as a very pragmatic person. Yeah, I think that's generally correct. I, I'm probably a little more contrarian than anything else. And so okay. since it's just viewed as a rebuilding year for the Packers, I probably just kind of lean into that a little bit. But um, I wrote a few columns before that about how I'm cautiously optimistic in a few ways. Um, and the, the thing about the NFL is p- teams routinely get really good really fast. Rebuilding in the NFL isn't like a gradual stepping stone from like six wins to eight wins to 10 wins. It's just not. Uh, and there's a lot working in the Packers favor this season. If they happen to hit with love, if he's actually a pretty good quarterback, and I don't even think he needs to be great. I think pretty good's good enough. Uh, they can instantly become a Super Bowl contender again. And it doesn't take that much. Um, their schedule is mm. very easy. The rest of the NFC is very weak. Their division in particular is extremely weak. And quarterback determines so much in the league that uh, if you happen to have one, and nobody knows Jordan Love's going to be good, bad, or anything else at this point, that he's looked good in the preseason. And if he is a top 10 uh, quarterback with their coaching staff, with their defensive personnel, they will instantly be Super Bowl contenders. Like I think that's basically a fact. Um, uh, and just to put like they're they are they're sisters with the 49ers. Like the 49ers okay. and the Packers run very similar systems. The, the 49ers, they have some problems, but... Generally speaking, they get more out of their quarterbacks than anybody else. And if you look at the list of uh, advanced stats, the best quarterbacks every year for the last three years, it's always the ones you expect. It's Patrick Mahomes. It's Aaron Rodgers. uh, It's Josh Allen. But then it's always Jimmy Garoppolo um, for uh, for some reason. That reason is the 49ers scheme is just very quarterback friendly. They're very good at allowing quarterbacks to make short throws and having their receivers uh, be the best at running after the catch of any team in the league. They're great at it. The Packers are set up for that now. Christian Watson is very good at that. I think Luke Musgrave will be very good at that. Uh, Malik Heath, who shot up out of nowhere, made the 53, and is likely to start week one, is very good at that. And Aaron Jones, the the rushing attack, is very good at that. I think that they will be systemically similar to the 49ers, and if they can do that, um, they will they will instantly be contenders in the league, like legitimate ones, not just pretenders like the Vikings were last year. uh well that's encouraging i actually we i had a i moderated an event with tom silverstein last night for the journal sentinel and someone asked that why no not someone i asked this question because we were specifically (laughs) talking about jordan love and his best prediction was he thinks he will be inconsistent is that he's like I, i honestly think he'll have some games where he throws 275 yards and multiple touchdowns and it's a great game and then there's going to be games where he throws only interceptions, not only the interceptions, but like two <laughs> interceptions, no touchdowns. Um, and then it will, but but he's what he said he's like he's fairly unflappable. And and what he also said was just how different the vibe is this year. Of like there's with- not this looming character or this looming lord <laughs> of Aaron Rodgers that is not only like over the team, but over personnel and everything. And so like just the, 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 the air and the space that has been created for guys to step up and become leaders that just wasn't there these last couple of seasons with Aaron right there that he, he's encouraged as well. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably correct. And Tom knows more about football than I ever will. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I think Jordan Love may be a little more consistent than that for w- one particular reason, which is okay. in the preseason, he definitely, so in college, he had accuracy problems and he's, he's fixed those up a little bit, but they still reared their head a couple times where he didn't hit guys quite in stride. The thing is um, he made the right read on almost every single pass he did. Um, we've got a couple guys who do film study uh, at my place, Justice Piscata and Dusty Evely, um, that charted basically every play, every passing play he had in the preseason and the, and going through the reads he was likely supposed to, we, we can never know for sure, but we can make educated guesses. And he basically made the right read every single pass, something that Aaron didn't even do in his last season. So I don't think he's as good or accurate a passer. But if you're running that offense properly and making the right read every time, it, it's going to work despite some errant throws now and then. So um, I, 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 he's a young kid. He's going to have some struggles. Tom's definitely right about that. Defenses vary widely from game to game. Um, but I suspect if nothing else, he'll make the right call basically every time he's out there. Well, that's encouraging. 
I'm excited. I can't wait but for the season to start. I'd, I'd like to know the the what what numbers are in Vegas right now for a Packers Jets Super Bowl. <laughs> Uh, that's going to be a pretty big long shot because um, uh, all the advanced predictions I've seen on both teams actually have them being about the same, uh, about 9.5 wins for each team. Um, okay. I actually I don't know the over-unders on those. I think the Packers is lower. I'm going to take the over on that. Um, but the Jets play in a much tougher division, so they have a, a yeah. tougher road to hoe, even though I think they're probably a little bit better team. But uh, I'm guessing the odds of that are pretty long. I bet you can make a fair penny if that comes to pass. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had one comment from our friend Joe McClear, who says, with all due respect, Paul, my Lions are going to devour the North in 23. It's going to be a battle for second place. And I wish the pack the best of luck in that regard. Agree no, or disagree? Uh, I, I, that is a fair statement. The Lions, okay. uh, by all projections I've seen, are uh, Vegas and otherwise, uh, FTNL's projections, uh, they're about 10 win projection. They're definitely the other good really? team in the North uh, and are projected to win it by most. So that's totally fair. Um, Holy and they, they had a, they had a good off season as well. They, they did a nice job turning over a lot of players on their defense. Uh, they're, they are the class of the division. The Packers, I think are a little bit more of a long shot, but uh, they're not as much as people think they are. And there's a very good chance that Jordan love turns out to be better than Jared Goff, um, who is the Lions' starting quarterback who is a good but not great quarterback. So you got that too. But yeah, they're both better than the Lions and the Bears by a country mile. So, or the Vikings. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, the Vikings and the Bears. The Lions and the Packers are better than <laughs> All right. Well, I wanted to, with a couple minutes that we have left, I saw this headline and I wanted to get your opinion on it. But uh, AI sports reporter not ready for <laughs> prime time. So the Columbus Dispatch, which is owned by Gannett, used AI to report on high school sports. And it didn't go very well. And so when you're thinking about the usefulness of AI or the threat of AI when it comes to your job as a sports writer, what what do you think? Um, so it, it has a long way to go to actually write things in a capacity where people want to read it. And okay. um, I, I, the artistic part of writing where you actually write things people want to read is a whole different story. This was supposed to be yeah. just a game recap. It was supposed to just tell you what happened, who the stars were, uh, things like that. There's a lot of problems with doing that, with especially with the generative AIs that exist, with ChatGPT, um, with anything similar to that. First of all, um, that's not going to work because those all have to be trained on data sets that are available. And you can't have breaking news as part of a data set. So right away, that was a poor use case for that. If you're going to use AI at all, you're going to need to do it for some kind of feature writing um, and even in that, it's not good because um, generative AI is not Google, which is not even Google anymore. It doesn't look up facts for you. All it does is tell you what it thinks you want to hear next. And mm. so it's not going to get statistics right. It's not going to get facts right. Uh, it will make a suggestion on writing style. It is good at bouncing ideas off to tell you, like, if you ask, it, like, hey, what are the, like, the 10 best things to do in Wisconsin? It'll give you like a nice 10 list to maybe look into. But that's kind of it. So unless you have a generative AI that has a data set underneath it of all the high school football scores you want it to do and has trained on specifically how to write those game reports, um, it's not going to work for that. And to make that happen, Gannett would have to actually put money into developing that as a yeah. specific thing that it does and do some pretty hardcore programming to do it. So those things can be useful. They can be useful for bouncing ideas off of, for writing formations, for digging into big data sets that you pile them on top of. But if you ask any any generative AI to write you a column right now, it's going to be awful. There you go. So not threatened yet. <laughs> yeah, take that, the robots. <laughs> All right, Paul Dunin, as always, so much fun to have you here. We'll have you back in about two weeks uh, when the season will be here. And yep, we'll have yep. more to talk about. It's kicking off. College is this weekend. Pros are next. Should be a good time. Super fun. It's your it's your prime time, man. All yes, right. Thanks is. so much, Paul. We'll talk to you soon. Right. And when we come back, Milwaukee Magazine. We got an announcement. Oh boy. This is As Goes Wisconsin. Welcome back to As Goes Wisconsin. I am Kristen Bry. He is Greg Bach. And uh I got some pretty cool news. I guess this was over the weekend that I first got a screenshot of a picture of the news, but I was waiting until I actually got the hard copy before I did anything about it. Um, but I don't know how many months ago, but we found out on air, on air, that was really was on air um, at a supper club. A yeah, a couple months ago uh, that we had been nominated 
to for Milwaukee Magazine as best radio host. And I was very surprised then, even when we were nominated. And I think the other uh, Pete was Earl, um, Earl Ingram, obviously our friend and colleague. Uh, for this was the Milwaukee area. Uh, Mark Belling, Tariq Moody. Who was the fourth person? I'm trying to think of who the fourth person was. It was me. And I, you know, I put put out on social media. I was like, oh, I'm nominated for this. It'd be great. Like, vote for me. And not thinking, you know, as the very much newbie of that group, that uh, anything would happen. But lo and behold, uh, <laughs> Milwaukee Magazine, they put out their newest, uh, their newest edition. Our, so simply the best, our guide to everything that's great in Milwaukee. So the issue has a lot of editors' choices for what they think are the best restaurants and the best, you know, in the food scene and lifestyle and a bunch of different things. And then they get to your best, which is uh, the reader's choice poll. And lo and behold, radio host number one, Kristen Bray. We'll put it up for the live screen. So I went to Barnes and Noble yesterday and bought multiple copies. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I was very, I was very surprised. And my either Midwest modesty or imposter syndrome is like, well, I don't know, like trying to make excuses of why I would have won this. Um, because, you know, I'm still so new at this, but I'm going to take the W and a win is a win. And I'm I'm going to say that I'm proud of myself and proud of this show and the fact that what we've been able to do in a year. So there's that. Guess what? What? I'm proud of you too. Oh, thanks, Greg. <laughs> you do good work, my friend. Um. So yeah, I wish Jane was here so she could be yeah. she could be part of it because she's obviously been a massive part of this show. Um. But yeah, that was that was very cool. And so and then right underneath media personality, I'll give you one guess who won that. Charlie Barron's, yeah, with John McGivern right behind. <laughs> you know what's funny? I was trying to think of something smart alecky, but I'm like, eh, just it's Charlie. And then, uh, but do you know who Rich Evans is? No, but neither you, do when, I. But when you wrote it down, when you sent me the text, you said, "Never mind, Chris Evans." I'm like, what? Oh, I was like, Rich Evans. I know you're thinking of Captain America. So they and they have a little blurb about Rich Evans coming in third for media personality, and they said, "We admit it." We didn't include the extremely online Milwaukee-based Red Letter Media celebrity. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I I don't know his name, but I know Red Letter. Uh, they they do. They're very popular. On Are YouTube. they? Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. My friend Tim, shout out to Tim Higgins, is a great improviser, actor, and performer. Does a lot of work with them. But yeah, they are on YouTube. They do like best of, worst of, and reviews. they're ba- located in Milwaukee. They're Wisconsin. I think they're Milwaukee-based. If not, they they are Wisconsin-based for sure. But yeah, they are very popular interesting yeah. is it like milwaukee record ad- adjacent as far as no they just kind of they don't really do it like it, it, there's no I, I don't feel like when i watch the video there's like a sense of like milwaukee or wisconsin it's a just it's pop culture it's reviews things like that you know well yeah they have 1.4 million almost 1.5 million subscribers yeah. on youtube i did not know that this was based in uh Wisconsin. But yeah. yeah. So Rich Evans, who is a Milwaukee based red letter media celebrity, they didn't put him in their nominees, but uh they got it was a it was a red letter write-in campaign and he got third. Nice. And so um, but yeah, so I, you know, I think it's cool because it means that people are actually listening, people are actually voting, and uh I don't take that lightly. And they like you. They, they like, really, really, really like, like you. you. Yeah. Oh. Kristen Bry. Um, so yeah, so if you voted, thank you. Uh, for everyone who listens both to the podcast and to the live show or watches the live stream. Um, thank you for, you know, being a part of the show as always. And tell your friends. Uh, we're still growing. We're still growing. And I as I said to you on the text message uh when you sent this to me, you know, I'd like to thank the audience for voting me uh, best Wednesday co-host slash sit-in producer. Because yeah. I feel like if this is the case, then I'm by proxy, I've won an award too. Totally. And I want to say thank you to everyone who voted for Kristen and then me, whether you knew it or not. Whether you knew it or not. <laughs> but uh, in a, I think in two weeks, we'll have Chris Drosner back, who's the executive editor of Milwaukee Magazine. I promise he didn't cheat for me, but I maybe we'll, yeah. we'll pick his brain a little bit more on 
Um, you just will not let this win just happen. You're just like, well, it's like you, I look at Tariq Moody, who got second, who is like unbelievably influential in the Milwaukee radio scene. Yeah, he started. He's part of Radio Milwaukee. He started mm-hmm. Hyphen, like you know, and that's music radio, so it's a little, it's maybe a little different, but he is very influential. Mark Belling, influential in a, a different kind of way. Popular, like known, very well known. Yeah. <laughs> you know, been around for a very long time. He got third. So I think there's a part of it that's like, I feel a little bit like, what? really? Me? Really? But, I mean, hey, you know? Magic Johnson walked into the NBA, won a championship his first year in. So, hey, whatever. I mean, it's possible. <laughs> sports. That's fair. Sports go sports. Um hold the clip for tomorrow yeah let's hold the clip for tomorrow. okay yeah because when, you did you managed to clip together a clean clip of yeah, amy i found some i found a, i found a good one yeah so but remind people who's who's the laughing tap just says we uh it's a, a amy miller three shows one friday two saturday laughing tap.com for tickets uh it's gonna be a lot of fun she's been on comedy central a bunch of times really cool person we're, we're looking forward to that so very fun yeah. very fun were you gonna say something else no i'm just gonna you oh, well you know you know what you're great you're great. Oh, you're doing a great job filling in for Jane. How are you feeling? Yeah, Comfortable? I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. This you is like the vibe. You today, have like your flow going. Yeah, yeah. I got my screens going. I've got everything's happening here. I'm keeping the eye out for the for the phone, making sure people are being heard, and you know it's cool. It's it, it's fun. I like this. I, this this is a really fun job. Good. Good. I'm glad. All right. Yeah. Well, tomorrow uh, we're gonna have Pat Kreitlow from Up North News is gonna be back for our crossover, uh, and then Matt Miller is gonna be here. He was just he just got married. He went on his honeymoon, <gasps> but he's here for our monthly pop culture update. Um, I have a very interesting. Uh, am I the sphincter for tomorrow? That is uh, this dad banned all of his daughter's once in a lifetime events because she was caught bullying. And people are applauding his harsh punishment. But he wants to know, is he the sphincter? So we will Mm. talk about that. So full Friday, come back tomorrow, 10 a.m. for As Goes Wisconsin once again. But thank you for being part of today's show. With the award-winning Kristen Bryant. And if you have voted, (laughs) thank you for voting. All right. Have a great day.